and Acting Surgeon General. Dr. Lishman. Great. Thank you so much, Jay. So thank you again for being here. For people in the back standing, there's some places left here. I, this is so exciting because we're beginning to fill this place up, especially from the student's perspective. I know that we always start rather early in the morning. So right now is when we're going to reach that saturation point. As students, and I see some of my faculty are coming in as well. Good job. <laughs> uh, so we're going to stop. We just went live stream as well. And the problem with live stream is I don't know how many people are out there who register for this meeting. But in essence is we are now live. So everybody turn around towards the cameras and wave high. <laughs> Welcome our live stream people. Now, I've made this a signature event for us in that we start out. We talk about health and well-being, so we're going to start out with that approach. It's an exercise that exemplifies health, right? This is something I've been doing almost at every speech lately, especially when I have an audience who has not heard this before, but even the ones who are repeat customers. So in essence, I'm going to ask you if you are able to stand up, stretch, move your muscles, right? Everybody get up and stretch, move that neck. Doesn't it feel good to move around? Right? Isn't that grand that we're moving around? <laughs> now when you're also into that mood, I want you to turn to your left, turn to your right, introduce yourself, shake hands if appropriate, <laughs> hug, do whatever you want, tell people who you are. Welcome to the School thank of Public Health. Thank you. Once again, I can't thank you enough. For George, thank you for being here, buddy. Oh, my pleasure, my Paul. Hi, friends. Carlos Williams says hello. Oh, great. Oh, hi. Oh, Ramey's a Yes, he's a fellow with me. Welcome. Okay, once we've done that, once we've done that, I'm going to ask you to either sit in your place or stand if you want to. And I want you to center yourself. I, I want you to close your eyes if it you know, if it feels good. And let's think about how special today is. First of all, for all of you who are already in the world of public health, this is National Public Health Week. Let's be thankful for the career paths that we have chosen. Let's be thankful for the good that we bring to this world. Let's think about all those populations that we're affecting. Let's think about all those populations who are underserved, who are neglected, where we need to step up and do better. Let's be thankful for this time together. Let's be thankful for the new knowledge gained, for the new friendships achieved. Big deep breath in, breath out, breath in breath out. Life is good. And our mission, our mission is exciting. The mission of the Public Health Service, the uniform I formerly wore, is to protect, promote, and advance the health and safety of our nation. We, in this expanded world and partnerships in public health, do this with a joy, with an aspiration, and yes, I dare say, with an optimism that things will be better that we can move ahead. And as dean, I look at the eyes of the students, and that's where the optimism needs to be nurtured. Because at some point, you're going to hear, you heard from our leadership, from the deans, from the presidents, from provosts. You'll hear from the Surgeon General. But it ain't about us. We're here at this point in time. Ultimately, students, young people, we pass the baton to you. We may have screwed up a little bit along the pathway. We might have not done things perfectly. But in the long run, the job of public health is never done. There's always going to be something. So let's get inspired today. So this is a big deal. Number seven, my third as dean. I'm really excited for being here. And it's not only a matter of us people who have led this. We've done the accolades. This is an incredible team effort. But it's you, the participants. Thank you for taking time out of your busy days. Students, come on in. Plenty of seats up here. You want to sit next to the Surgeon General? I got two seats right next to him. <laughs> come on up. 
people from our health departments. George, thank you for being here. I'm not sure who else we have from health departments, but we had people registered from Charles, Anne Arundel, Carroll, and from Prince George's County here. We also have other universities represented. This is no longer just the UMD, go Terps, fear the turtle thing. This has become a regional thing where we gather together. Johns Hopkins, Georgetown, Morgan State, Towson, American, UMBC, GW. Federal health agencies are in the family. FDA, CDC, HRSA, NIH, NCI. Hospitals, health care systems are in the house. UMMC, Holy Cross, LifeBridge, MedStars Union Memorial, among others. I'm also pleased, as you are, sir, I'm sure, of the number of people we have in uniform. I want everybody who has served our nation in uniform, any of the seven uniform services, to please stand up, active duty or retired, to get the acclamation of the audience for those who have served our nation in uniform. Well done, team. And I miss you a lot, public health service officers. So for those who know me, I wore the uniform for 27 years. It is so cool because the first time I met Surgeon General Adams, we were reversed. I was the guy in uniform, and you were the guy in a suit. How great that life takes us down all these different pathways. So a short story. Right, we have on this stage here today an important addition to the School of Public Health at the University of Maryland. And I, I'm sure that the entourage from the OSG, when I was in the Office of the Surgeon General, was always cool. I'm sure that the same thing continues under the current administration. But if you had five or more people traveling together, you got to use the Public Health Service helicopter to get here, right? <laughs> so, I'm not, I'm not, you know, so I'm very happy. I do want to acknowledge the person who's taken on the role of my former job. She's been on the job now for four weeks, Rear Admiral Erica Schwartz, the new Deputy Surgeon General of the United States. Stand up, wave high. And knowing how the hard work continues, I want to acknowledge also Captain Joe Dulé, who's the new Chief of Staff in the Office of the Surgeon General. I was worried earlier because my wife Trish Cusimano, he's, she's here too, wave high Trish. Uh, so she was talking with Rear Admiral Schwartz and they're going off on something, they're laughing and all that. And I thought to myself, uh-oh, here's the talk from the wife of the former Surgeon General, uh, that acting Surgeon General and former Deputy Surgeon General telling the current uh, Deputy Surgeon General, here's where my husband screwed up, don't do it that way. But back to this idea of what do we have on stage. So you must have been surprised to see the Surgeon General's flag. Now every Assistant Surgeon General, every Rear Admiral in the Public Health Service gets their own flag, right? I have one that I'll bring to the office one of these days, it's sitting at home right now, but I think it should be at the school, is a white flag with a blue anchor in Caduceus, the symbol of the Public Health Service. Surgeon General, however, is very special. There's only one of these flags. It's the blue background with the white anchor in Caduceus. And I'm sure you must have been surprised. Where the heck did they get a Surgeon General's flag here at the University of Maryland? Well, January 11th this past year, we celebrated the 55th anniversary of the first Surgeon General's report on smoking and health. I was blessed and honored to be the acting Surgeon General. We celebrated the 50th, right? It was a commemoration, a celebration of what public health can do. And just a few weeks ago, it was 55 years since that quintessential report that changed our culture. It changed our culture. It was a report that started something that changed the way we can do it. If you aren't an optimist in public health, just use that as an example of what we can do. Because right now, if you light up in here, not only is, are you going to cause gnashing of teeth and discomfort, you're going to be breaking laws. right? This is a smoke-free campus. We don't allow this. Our culture has changed. The youth of today aren't used to this. Yes, we have a vaping issue. We have to make sure we don't give up on that. But back to the accoutrement on stage. When I was acting Surgeon General to 50th, I got to know the family of Luther Terry, the Surgeon General who came up with the report. Luther Terry now honored as one of the few public health service officers buried at Arlington National Cemetery. Right, that's quite an honor. 
Luther Jr., also known as Luke, Michael Terry, his two sons, became friends because of that event five years ago. And every so often we just send emails, right? We have that ability to interact occasionally. One of them is on the, the board of the Commission Officers Foundation. Jim Curry, Colonel Curry, where are you? The Commission Officers Association and Foundation is a key member to here. Jim, please stand up, wave hi to the group. Commission Officers Association, a key sponsor of this event. Well, about four weeks ago, I get an email from Luke Jr., from Luther Jr., Luke. And he says, Boris, how are things going? How's the deanship going? And oh, by the way, my wife and I, we just moved to a new place down here in Florida. And it's smaller. We don't have that many places to sort of store, store things. I'm sending you something in the mail. And what comes in the mail? What comes in the mail? Luther Terry's Surgeon General's flag. Isn't that amazing? This is history, ladies and gentlemen. This probably hasn't been shown in public for 50 years, perhaps even 55 years. This is Luther Terry. This is a spirit of a person, not one person, a spirit of a whole movement that changed our lives, that changed our nation, that made us healthier. We now have this as something to have in the School of Public Health to show our students each and every day of what we can achieve in public health, of what's doable in public health. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Surgeon General Luther Terry's flag. Let's hoop and holler, because this is so cool. And now another hoop and holler, because I'm here to present the Surgeon General of the United States. Vice Admiral Adams, he's a native Marylander, right? He's one of us, as you heard, a Terp fan, right? He kind of grew up around this campus, with this campus. His father worked here. He was ra raised in Mechanicsville in St. Mary's County. Before becoming the Surgeon General in 2017, he served as the Indiana State Health Commissioner. That's where we met, appointed by then Governor Mike Pence. He has made addressing the opioid crisis and mental health issues among his top priorities. You can read his whole bio. There's a lot there. But here's a person who, who worked hard to get to where he's at. Right. We talked about the issues of underrepresented minorities in medical schools. He broke through barriers. He worked two jobs while being a medical student. He was out there sending money home. Sometimes we neglect to look at the struggles of our own students as they're trying to attain things. Here, ladies and gentlemen, is a gentleman, an officer, and the 20th Surgeon General of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Jerome Adams. You want this? Or? Well, good morning, everyone. Wow, that was quite the uh, introduction. I'm bringing you everywhere, Boris. <laughs> Anyone know what these are? Anyone? Naloxone. I always bring it with me everywhere I go, and um, I'm just going to set this up here so you all can. permeate your brains while, uh, while we're having a discussion. Thank you, President Perman, uh, for the opportunity to come here today. I, I really uh, genuinely appreciate it. And again, uh, this is home for me. I spent a lot of time here in uh, undergrad. Just a few weeks ago, I pulled out my 2002 University of Maryland National Champions t-shirt that I uh, got back in 2002, and it's still in my closet, and I break it out every year during the NCAA tournament in the hopes that I will be able to, uh, to, to wear it proudly when they become champions yet again. They're on the upswing, they're on the upswing. Uh, you know, I, I want to go off script uh, really early because I've learned from Boris that sometimes you just throw the script away. I want to invite uh, uh, Admiral Schwartz up to the stage. I want to invite Admiral Askew up to the, or Dr. Askew up to the stage, and um, Dr. Reese, please come up. Please, I'd love for the three of you to come up and stand up here next to me for a second. Because it is National Public Health Week, but it is also Minority Health Month. And if you all 
um, go on YouTube, you'll see that at, at several, on several occasions, I've spoken about growing up in rural Maryland. And I actually was a, a good student. I had straight A's all through school. But I never in my wildest dreams thought I could, would be a physician because I'd never met a black doctor. Didn't know they existed. Didn't know that was such a thing. The first black doctor who I met wasn't until I was in college when I actually met Dr. Ben Carson when I was in college at UMBC. So it is really important to me that we acknowledge how different our world is today. I've never met a black dean of a medical school who didn't come from an HB, who wasn't at an HBCU. This is, this is history for me, to be able to meet you. Admiral Schwartz, the first African-American female to be chief medical officer of the United States Coast Guard. She and I were at the Pentagon just last week walking around, and uh, oh my gosh, people's eyes were popping out of their heads to see an uh, African-American three-star and an African-American female two-star. There was one lady who followed us through several floors, and, and she did, and she finally said, oh my gosh, I just want to shake your hands. I mean, I, I think it's really important because we a lot of times forget how far we've come. And to have someone who's running public health for an entire county, you know, in a county that not too long ago, um, African Americans were slaves, were, uh, were not considered to be equal. And now to have someone in a role where he's in charge of health for the entire county, three different doctors up here. This is important that we celebrate during my Minority Health Month. So thank you all, all so much for being role models. I really appreciate being invited here to speak on Public Health Research Day. And again, honored to be here at University of Maryland. It's, it's a pleasure to see so many folks who are championing the cause for public health. Um, students, raise your hands. Well, who are my students out there? All right, see, they're, they're in the back. Uh, I'm, I'm going to pick you all out, and I'm going I'm to ask you all some questions. One of the things I miss most about being a, a professor at Indiana University for the last 10 years is I don't get the opportunity to inter interact with students as much. So I was really excited to, to come here today and get the chance to speak with all of you. Um, excited for all the researchers. I started off as a, uh, as a researcher at UMBC. Funny story, the president of UMBC says I am his best failure uh, because I was in a program designed to increase the number of African-American males getting PhDs. And uh, I didn't get my PhD, I just became Surgeon General, so <laughs> still time. Still time, but to the researchers out there, thank you. To the nonprofits in attendance and the corporations, and I'm especially excited by the attendance of students and faculty from uh, areas beyond health and healthcare. School of Business, anyone here from the School of Business? All right, you all tell them that the Surgeon General called them out. <laughs> tell them next year they need to be here because they are critical. I know we have school, uh, engineering folks here. Anyone from engineering? School of Agriculture, where's my dean? Right there. Fans, can you stand up? Speak. School of Agriculture, thank you for being here. Critically important. You know, I actually did a TED Talk this past Saturday where I talked about my experience growing up in rural Maryland and uh, how one of my worst ever asthma attacks came after uh, working in a barn full of tobacco leaves hung out to dry. And it may seem uh, ironic to you that the Surgeon General helped support an industry that killed so many Americans. But the fact is, my parents didn't have a lot of money. And uh, I did what I had to do to earn an income, because if I wanted anything beyond the bare essentials, it wasn't like my kids today, Alexa, order new shoes. <laughs> if I wanted Air Jordans, I had to get a job. And the jobs in Southern Maryland were the tobacco fields. And so we need to understand uh, the, the, the circumstances that people are in. We need to understand 
what motivates them to do different things. We need to understand that agriculture can help, help lift us up or it can help suppress our health. And the more that we work together and find alignment, the more we will promote a healthier society. Architecture, I know the Dean of Architecture was here. Thank you so much for being here. Also critically important, we put out the new physical activity guidelines, 150 to 300 minutes a week. Uh, you know, it's one thing for us from a health point of view to say this is what you should do. I'm a physician. I've stood in front of my patients many times and said you need to exercise more. You go into half these buildings, you can't find the stairs. You know, we, we need to think about how we design our buildings so that they promote health, so that they promote mental health, bringing people together instead of putting people in closets and in cubicles where they don't interact with, uh, with one another and then wondering why we have all these workplace mental health incidents. And, uh, and then that spills over into built communities, making sure we're designing communities that are walkable. So again, critically important that you're here and I hope you all get the chance to interact with some of the folks here who are outside of the health sphere because uh, it's critical that we partner with them if we truly want to improve health. And that's what my comments are going to touch on. The fact is, you each have a role in our nation's health, so thank you for uh, what you do. I'm going to back up a little bit. Dr. Lushniak talked about the Surgeon General's flag, but what's interesting, and we've got a lot of students in here, um, I've given a lot of these talks, and in many cases, people have no clue what the Surgeon General even is or does. And so, uh, first of all, I'm not the Attorney General. <laughs> Don't want his job. Uh, he, the, the, the previous attorney general was about this tall and a white guy. The current attorney, attorney general is about this tall and a white guy. So uh, I don't look anything like him, but I've been introduced as both of those two gentlemen on several occasions. <laughs> Second, uh, to the untrained eye, I may appear to be an airline pilot. <laughs> I've also been uh, asked for snacks and headphones on multiple occasions. But uh, you don't want me anywhere near the cockpit of your plane. And uh, finally, I'm neither a surgeon nor a general. And actually, someone started a petition when I became surgeon general to say that I shouldn't be surgeon general because I wasn't a surgeon. I'm actually an anesthesiologist. Uh, you don't have to be a surgeon to be the surgeon general. And I am not a general. I'm a vice admiral in the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps. We took on Navy rankings uh, when the Corps was first started, largely because uh, one of the original roles of the Public Health Service was to inspect ships and to uh, examine people as they were coming into ports, so that they weren't bringing diseases into our country. And what's interesting is, 200 years ago, we were worried about measles being brought into our country and spreading. Never thought that as Surgeon General of the United States in 2019, I'd be dealing with measles being brought into our country and spread into our communities, especially when we have a proven vaccine that is safe and effective to prevent the spread of measles. But that's one of the challenges we have, and I hope you all will talk about that today. Now, I often say um, public health hasn't changed much in the last 50 years. Eat better, move more, get your sleep, don't smoke. Anyone not know that? 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago? The fact is, in most cases, we know what the right thing to do is, but we need to figure out how to better speak to people, communicate with them, how to better motivate them to do the right things. And that's, to me, is, is really the key to public health and what we have done a very poor job of actually doing. It's coming down off the stage, from behind the podium, sitting down to folks and talking to them and listening to them and figuring out what motivates them and how we can help them attain their goals so that they actually change their behavior in a way that leads to healthier communities. Now, during my tenure, there are three main areas I'm focused on. One of the biggest challenges of being Surgeon General or being in any of these prominent health roles is uh, there is a line of people outside my office every day, and they all want me as Surgeon General to make their health issue my top priority. And I want to make all of them my top priority, but you can't boil the ocean. And so at some point, you've got to figure out where can I have impact and uh, where can we lift up things that are going to help everyone. And so my three 
um, main priorities that I'm working on are number one, addressing substance misuse. And in particular, we're really focused on the opioid epidemic. Uh, in the words of the great philosopher Mike Tyson, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. I didn't plan to work on opioids, but it's the punch in the mouth we've all received. But it's also a tremendous opportunity. And what do I mean um, when I say it's an opportunity? Well, five years ago, and I've been in public health for 25 years, five years ago I wouldn't have been able to go to a town and get the mayor, the head of the hospital, the head of the health department, the school superintendent, the sheriff, the CEO of the largest business to come in and talk about any health issue. They just wouldn't have shown up. Now I can go to any community in America and get all those folks and more to show up to talk about the opioid epidemic. And so it is an opportunity to bring folks together. Now we need to use that opportunity to talk about not just overdoses in the lock zone, but to talk about the upstream factors that lead to opioid misuse. Talk about substance misuse in general. Talk about mental health issues and untreated anxiety and depression that lead to substance misuse. Talk about uh, ACEs and, 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 and resilience and, and building healthy communities. So even if you're not interested in opioids, even if it's not something that you're personally working on, try to think about how you can use the opioid epidemic and the attention that it's bringing to folks and the people that it's bringing together to put wind in your sails to lift up the issues that you most care about. And like Boris, I, uh, I love stories. Uh, when I was state health commissioner in Indiana, one of the things that I really wanted to lift up, remember everyone's got a plan, was a long-acting reversible contraception. Uh, but Bible Belt had a really hard time getting traction. Interestingly enough, one of my buddies is the, uh, is the health commissioner of Tennessee. Tennessee's even more in the Bible Belt. You would have never thought they would have had success lifting up long-acting reversible contraception in Tennessee. But through the lens of the opioid epidemic, uh, they, they uh, realized that people were concerned about the number of babies being taken away from their moms, the number of people who were being turned over to Child and Protective Services. And so they started to look at who those moms were, and they were moms who were ending up in jail because of the opioid epidemic. They were moms who had multiple kids, and uh, the stress contributed to their substance misuse and contributed to their children being taken away. And so now they are leading the country in terms of providing the option of long-acting reversible contraception to women who are incarcerated so that they don't come back out and end up in an even worse situation because they're having more and more kids. And so I just tell that story because it's an example of something that you would never think is going to be related to the opioid epidemic, but an opportunity you have to push different initiatives because of the people who are coming together and the attention that, uh, that's being paid. As Dr. Lushniak mentioned, also very concerned about the rise in vaping that's going on in our society. We should celebrate that flag. We should celebrate Dr. Terry. Um, smoking rates have been going down consistently for several decades, particularly among our young people. Tobacco use has been going down, but now tobacco use is starting to go back up again in young people, and that's being driven largely by e-cigarettes e and vaping. We also uh, need to have, a, I think, a more nuanced conversation about marijuana. You've got two camps. You either believe marijuana is all good and we shouldn't say anything bad about it, or you believe that marijuana is all bad and we shouldn't even entertain the fact that it could have any redeeming, uh, redeeming uh, uh, qualities. Well, the truth lies in between. And uh, I'm really concerned about the number of women who are smoking marijuana while pregnant or consuming marijuana while pregnant. I'm concerned about youth attitudes about marijuana usage because we know, the science shows us, marijuana can have a, uh, it does have a, a negative effect on the developing brain, including in the fetus. But uh, really need to have that conversation up front so that we aren't looking back 5, 10, 20 years down the road and saying we woulda, coulda, shoulda uh, put the brakes on this or at least been more thoughtful about the way we're implementing policies. And I know that's the case here in Maryland where they've recently uh, made it a lot more available for people to access marijuana. Um, even though that's medical. We know that uh, I was in Arizona and they said the number one way that youth are accessing marijuana is through people who have a medical marijuana card. It's diversion. So again, we need to talk about these things and I hope you all have the courage to broker a conversation that goes beyond tweets and that goes beyond headlines. 
I'm also working on improving the health of our communities by making the connection between investments in health and resultant economic prosperity. That may sound weird to you all too, but if you look at Gallup polls, remember I said communication is where we're failing, behavior change is where we're failing. If you look at Gallup polls, the number one issue people vote on, Democrat or Republican, black or white, rural or urban, is what? Jobs and the economy. You know what people don't vote on? They don't vote on health. And I'm not saying that to discourage you. Um, I'm saying that so that you realize that the language we're speaking in and what we're selling is not what voters out there are buying. So we need to translate what we're selling into a language that resonates with folks. And then the third thing I'm wor working on is raising awareness of the link between our nation's health and its safety and security. We know that communities that are healthier have less crime. We know, uh, well, maybe you don't know this. This is a shocking stat that I'm sure some of you actually don't know. Seven out of 10 of our 18 to 24 year olds in this country are actually ineligible for military service. Seven out of 10, because they can't pass the physical, can't meet the educational requirements, or have a criminal background record. So I told you number one issue people vote on is jobs in the economy. Number two issue people vote on consistently is safety and security. So if we can frame health in terms of how it makes us a safer and more secure nation, country, community, then we'll get more people paying attention to what we are selling. When the solutions are complex, and especially when they're controversial, we need partnerships and collaboration. And uh, to go back to my second point, improving community health and economic prosperity is a prime example of, of this. CHEP, as I like to call it, because we love our acronyms in government, is the concept that community health and economic prosperity are inextricably linked, that communities that invest in health see dividends not just in traditional health metrics, but also in job growth and in wage increases. And uh, I'll tell you another story. I was at the US Conference of Mayors, and I had Mayor Bill de Blasio from New York sitting on one side of me, Mayor Benjamin from South Carolina, uh, Columbia, South Carolina, sitting on the other side of me, had about 40 mayors around the table, and I wanted to know what made them tick. So I asked them uh, a question. I said, how many of you all ran for office on a pledge to lower your community's hemoglobin A1C rates by 15%? <laughs> and uh, I was shocked. Not a single one raised their hand. <laughs> but we like to go out as public health advocates and talk about diabetes prevention programs. And they're great because they lower hemoglobin A1C rates. But that's not what's motivating folks. But Columbia, South Carolina is now one of the most walkable cities in America. It wasn't because of hemoglobin A1C. It was because when they created walkable communities, there was more foot traffic out. There was more light and crime went down. It was because when they created a walkable community, more people uh, were downtown spending money and tax revenues went up. The businesses did better. Property values went up. And guess what? It also lowers hemoglobin A1C. <laughs> but instead of leading with that, if we lead with the, health, the economic benefits of, of uh, the different programs that we, that we are uh, interested in people adopting, then we'll, we'll have more success. And to my researchers in the crowd, that starts with you all. Because yes, we need to show that we can lower hemoglobin A1C rates and lower systolic blood pressures and improve health metrics, but we've also got to, in our studies, start to evaluate what we're doing based on metrics that people care about based on safety and security and job growth and wage growth. Anyone hear about this company called Amazon? Uh, well, over the last year and a half, there's been a, a fight amongst communities across the country about trying to bring Amazon's second headquarters to, uh, to, to various cities. Here's the thing that a lot of folks don't know. Where'd they end up? You all know, you all know that one. Anyone know where they en ended up? Crystal City, Virginia. If you look around Crystal City, Virginia, four of US News and World Report's 20 healthiest cities in the entire United States surround Crystal City, Virginia. That is not a coincidence. Companies move to places where there is a healthy workforce. And we need to go to communities, to mayors, to policy leaders and say, look, not because of hemoglobin A1C, but because if you want to get Amazon to move to your town, you need to invest in smoke-free communities and complete streets and the things that we all work on each and every day to prove are effective at, uh, at improving health. Now, uh, 
I want you all to, to think about three things that you should remember, and I'm going to go through these quickly because I want to save time for uh, some remarks. But these are three points that I would make to, uh, to the health advocates in the crowd. Um, and you all know this, but I'm going to put a little bit of a different spin on it. Um, number one, one of our big problems in this country, and another wind in our sails, quite frankly, is that U.S. health care is expensive. We spend $3.4 trillion on health care each and every year, um, almost a fifth of our GDP, more than any other country. And again, these dollars aren't just diverted from company profits. They're diverted from critical funding priorities like job creation, wage increases, research and development. I travel uh, around sometimes with the folks from the Department of Labor, with, with Secretary Acosta. You know, we view the opioid epidemic as a public health crisis. He views the opioid epidemic as a labor crisis. We have more unfilled jobs in this country than we have people looking for work right now. And even though our economy is, is booming, it's at risk of stalling out because of America's poor health. It also pulls money again from that common resource pool. If we're spending more money on health care, that's less money for police cars. That's less money for, for fire trucks. That's less money for education. That's less money for the other priorities that we care about in our communities. And so it's critically important that we understand how much health care is costing us and the impact that it's having beyond just poor health. Number two, and that leads into it, is we're not getting what we pay for. We're not getting good value on health care. So we spend more than anyone else has some of the highest infant and maternal mortality rates, some of the lowest life expectancies. On measure after measure, we fall short. So we need to ask ourselves, how can it be that we spend so much and get so little? And um, I do want to stop here and, and go off a little bit. Um, it's not waste. And this is important, too. A lot of folks say there's waste in the healthcare system. That money isn't going into thin air. It's going somewhere. I was actually this morning looking at my uh, Advair inhaler that I still take. I've been taking it for 20 years for my asthma. It still costs over $100. That money's not waste. Somebody's getting that $100. Anyone in the room have a 401k? Raise your hand if you have a 401k or some sort of retirement plan. Well, again, one-fifth of our uh, GDP is going towards health care. So when we talk about waste on one side, we've got to understand that on, some si on the other side, many of you all are making money. You're, you're paying for your retirement home off of my $150 that my Advair cost. So we need to understand that the system is set up to get exactly the results that it's getting. And we've got to fundamentally think about how we change the system and create new incentives it's not just about cutting health care spending, it's trying to figure out how we can incentivize positive behavior and in the society that we live in, help people figure out how they can make money through prevention versus make money from simply treating people downstream. And, and this leads into the final point, and health folks, public health folks in the crowd are aware of this. Uh, 80 to 85 percent of health is driven by factors that have nothing to do with health care. Factors largely in our communities, from employment to housing to education to social support. Any people who work for hospitals in the audience? So nonprofit hospitals have to do a community needs assessment. And I've talked to a lot of hospitals. What is fascinating is if you talk to them over and over and over again, I've heard so many hospital um, CEOs tell me, we asked our community what their number one health issue is. And you know what consistently is the top answer? Affordable housing. And those CEOs say, no, 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 we want to know what your top health issue is. And the community says, yes, our top health issue is affordable housing. We need to understand that health is so much more than health care. And we spend 90, 95 percent of our time talking about health care, but not enough talking about the other factors that lead to health, good paying jobs and the skills to do those jobs. Uh, not just affordable housing, but safe housing that's not contaminated by lead and mold and other contaminants. Uh, transportation to take us to our employments and our parks and our grocery stores. We can come up with the best health care plan in the world. We can come up with the best hospitals in the world. But if folks still can't get from their home to the doctor's office because they don't have access to transportation, that health care is only going to serve to increase disparities. And uh, you know, I'm going to skip these remarks, because I, I, a lot of this, because I, I want to save time for engagement, but I do want to leave it, you all with a call to action. Uh, as public health experts, 
as uh, leaders in areas beyond public health, you all have unique opportunities to leverage your influence and resources to forge better partnerships, stronger partnerships that more effectively promote the health, the economic prosperity, and the safety of your communities. So I, I want you to ask yourself, who belongs at the table to identify and address the barriers to good health in our communities? We often speak to the choir, and that's important. I love coming here and speaking to the choir because sometimes you got to pat them on the back and tell them they're singing a good song. But you have to realize that you're not going to bring more people into the church if you keep speaking to just the choir. How, many, how often have you all reached out to local law enforcement? Because they're critical in addressing the opioid epidemic. Uh, the most common place you're going to encounter people who are suffering from substance misuse disorder are in the ER and in the, and in the, um, and in the, uh, the jails. They're not going to show up, they're not going to get a, a, a well visit and schedule a well visit and come in to see you. They're typically not going to come into your health department unless they have a, a problem. So how do we partner with law enforcement, faith leaders? How do we partner with them? And I'm happy to share my story about Scott County, Indiana, uh, where we had the largest HIV outbreak related to injection drug use in the history of the United States. Uh, if folks uh, want to talk a little bit more about that, but really change the way I look at who we need to bring to the table to, to solve health concerns. When's the last time you brought in school superintendents? Not to tell them that their kids are fat, but to tell them that you have ways to help them lift up test scores, lower discipline problems. Uh, uh, quick story from Indiana, uh, I visited a school out in rural, um, rural Indiana, and uh, I was the head of the State Department of Health, and we had funding to put bikes in schools. And again, my nutrition and physical activity folks first went out there and pointed out the obesity rates in the community and said, we need you to, to we're going to give you money to help institute this, uh, these, uh, these programs to help your kids become more physically fit and physically active. And the school teachers said, yeah, we understand that's an issue, but we're getting paid or not paid based on how they do on test. And we're spending all of our time dealing with discipline issues. And as much as we would love to focus on their obesity, we just don't have time for that. But then we showed them a study, back to my researchers, that showed that if kids get just 10 to 15 minutes of exercise in the morning, they're more attentive, their discipline problems go down, and they actually have higher test scores. And then we did a little pilot, and they saw that to play out in their classrooms. And we went from nobody wanting to access the bicycles, even if we were giving them to them for free, to the teachers fighting over who was going to get access to the bicycles before they took their standardized exams. So critically, critically important that you think about who's not at the table. Uh, number three, we need to go beyond worksite wellness. And I, I, I'm blasting through this. Worksite wellness is critically, critically important. But we can do everything right from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. for people while they're on the clock. But if we send them back home to environments that are unhealthy, we're going to undo a lot of those, those worksite wellness initiatives. And again, my Community Health and Economic Prosperity Initiative is not just about worksite wellness. It's about encouraging businesses to get involved in building complete streets and making sure there's access to fresh fruits and vegetables, in addition to making sure you have salad at the, uh, at the work cafeteria. So really stressing worksite, worksite involvement in the community. And uh, for state health officers and health care organizations, include non-health care organizations in the conversation, because again, 80% of health is in health care for academia. Focus on measurable and positive health outcomes for the health of the community in a much wider sense, economic health, safety, the other things that people care about. Business leaders understand the pressing health issues in your community, um, not for health sake, but because it matters to your bottom line. And uh, with that, I want to say to you all, it is the honor of my life to serve as your 20th United States Surgeon General. You know, people always ask me, are you having fun? And I, I really do feel blessed to be in this role. It's not fun when you go to city after city and have to talk about the terrible health disparities, to have to uh, uh, hear from parent after parent who's lost their child to, to uh, to an opioid overdose, to, to hear some of the terrible woes 
that continue to happen because of our nation's poor health. But that said, it also is a tremendous opportunity to engage folks, to uh, help them understand how you can help them achieve their goals, whether it's keeping their child safe, whether it's getting a job and being able to pay for those shoes, like that kid from rural Maryland who uh, worked in the tobacco field even though he had asthma, uh, really figuring out how um, we can engage those folks is critically important, and I, and I feel so honored to be able to, to be in a role where I can continue to engage those folks. So thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to questions and students. If you all don't uh, ask me some questions, I'm going to start calling you all out. So thank you. Thank you, Surgeon General Adams. Uh, Surgeon General's office and the Surgeon General himself had agreed uh, to having a format of a town hall meeting at this point. We have a bunch of submitted questions from students, faculty, and staff, and Jay will uh, ask the first question, but at the same time, we want audience participation. So as we ask the first question, please start stepping up to the two microphones here at the front. We just ask you to identify yourself when you ask the question. Uh, keep it as brief as possible, that would be great. I get the prerogative of, of asking the first question. Uh, told me I was gonna well, you will, you're gonna get the second question, so be ready to go. My first question, <laughs> sir, is uh, what kind of plane do you fly? <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> That's the pilot. Actually, my daughter wants to, to uh, fly a plane. We talked about role models. So um, I took my daughter to go see the, uh, what, Captain Mark. No, no, no. Just more and more role models for young girls and people of color. And I think that's critically important, and I think it's important that in your communities you lift up, just as I did earlier, uh, the uh, lift up the people who, uh, who you know have had to overcome a lot. Because you never know. There may be that kid who has a full. <laughs> we didn't think that she could fly a plane because she never had seen a female flying a plane. Well, thank you for that question. I was asked to go out there and I So, thank you. Um, I, I, we had some questions that were sent in by a variety of people, some here and some maybe um, listening in on, on the webcast. I'd rather talk to you all than talk to the cars, though, so start coming up to the Okay, I'm going to ask one and then turn it over to the real people. Um, this is a general question. If you could start your life over and still be in the position you're in now, what would you have done differently? And this is from Brianna Aldridge, an MPH in health equity student in the School of Public Health. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, that is a great question. If I could go back, what, what would I do differently? And uh, to the students in the crowd in particular, if I'm going to be very honest with you, uh, absolutely nothing. And that's not to say that there aren't decisions that I regret, that there aren't interactions that I wish um, I had handled differently. But if my, my son is 14 right now. If I take him out to a, uh, a big empty field and put him in a car and say drive and he just has a big open field to drive in and everything's easy and he comes back and says, Dad, I made it from one side to the other, uh, I can drive. Should I give him the keys to the car and let him go out on the beltway? No, absolutely not. Uh, everything that's happened in my life, even the bad things, it's led me to this point. I'm a more effective uh, advocate for people with substance use disorder because my brother is in prison in Maryland due to crimes he committed to support his addiction. I'm a more for effective advocate for people uh, who have asthma or for people who smoke because I worked in the Southern Maryland tobacco fields. And so I really do believe that, uh, that 
everything that happens happens to you for a reason and shapes you. And when you're coming across difficulties in your life, um, you can spend a whole lot of time stressing over why it happened and wishing it didn't happen and wishing you could change it, but you can't change it. So what I try to do is figure out um, what's the lesson that I can learn from this? How can I lift up people um, by sharing my story? And, uh, and, and that's, that, that's the, the most honest I can be with you about it. I, I wouldn't go back and, and change anything. Now, as a parent, if I could go back, I, uh, I would work a whole lot harder about, uh, on trying to get my kids to eat fruits and vegetables because uh, I have a 12-year-old, and I shouldn't say this to you as Surgeon General, but the kid probably gets a, a green vegetable in him about once every, about once every uh, two to three weeks. And, and it's, just, that's, it's just hard. And, uh, and as a parent, uh, you know, they all start off eating baby food, and at some point we start to stray as parents and give them uh, more and more options or say they don't like that anymore. Uh, but, uh, but a lot of things I would do differently as a parent, but as a uh, public health advocate, I think I'm here because of, uh, in many ways, the difficulties that I had and because it wasn't so easy and because I didn't make the right choice. You make the right choice, I mean, you know, go out and fly a kite. If it's a windy day and you throw the kite up and it takes off, easy peasy, you don't know how to fly a kite. It's that day when there's not that wind in your sails that you really have to know what you're doing to get that kite to go up in the air. So great question, Brianna. Uh, <clears throat> Hello, my name is Sergio Bondabada. I'm a senior here and a fellow, fellow Southern Marylander. I'm from Calvert County. Oh, all right. Yeah. Um, so my question is that uh, coming from Calvert County, I've noticed that a lot of the people around me have begun to have increasing doubts in the efficacy of vaccines. Mm -hmm. And I, you mentioned this as well with the measles outbreak as well. So my question is, what do you say to people who are so reluctant to listen? So I was out in uh, Washington and Oregon just a few weeks ago in Clark County where, uh, where the measles outbreak is really um, uh, flaring up, over 70 cases of measles. And there are a couple of things there. It's important to understand that, number one, there are people who are, I consider, vaccine resistant. You're not going to change their minds no matter what you say. And what's interesting is when you dig into the demographics, they tend to be educated. There are a lot of nurses. There are a lot of people with health degrees um, in that vaccine-resistant crowd. And I got cornered on a plane when I was going out on that trip by, by someone who, was a, uh, who recognized me and was in that vaccine-resistant crowd. And there was nothing I was going to say to her. As sir, as sir, she spent 45 minutes, she cornered me when I came out of the, the, uh, the bathroom on the back of the plane on a, on a ride to the, to the West Coast, true story, and uh, told me, you know, oh, for 45 minutes why I didn't know anything and what was wrong with my approach. But that said, there are a whole lot of people who are just vaccine hesitant. Um, not vaccine resistant, but vaccine hesitant. And we have to treat them with the utmost respect because the biggest way you're gonna push them in vaccine hesitant and the vaccine resistant is when they encounter a health professional who patronizes them, who treats them with disdain, who doesn't take the time to actually answer their questions. Because regardless of who you're talking about, everyone just wants what's best for their kids and their family. And so we need to do a better job of being servant leaders. Anyone heard of that concept of servant leadership? That's embedded through everything that I do. And uh, the talk I gave this morning really was about servant leadership. It's about figuring out how you can help people achieve their goals instead of saying to them, they need to help you achieve yours. And to a parent out there who is hesitant, who has fears, their goal is protecting their kid. And they see you as, as simply wanting to use their kid to get to your herd immunity, your idea of, of, of what you want to achieve or whatever else, whatever other propaganda is on there. And so you need to take the time to sit down with them. And one of the best things that I actually heard when I was in Washington was a doctor. And he said to me, you know, one of the challenges is I get 15 minutes in a well child visit and I've got to try to educate someone about vaccines and then very quickly get them to make a decision that they're hesitant about. So he said, I started holding Q and A's just after hours where folks could come in and it was a two hour session and they could just come in and ask any questions that they wanted. And it was a more relaxed atmosphere that didn't have a life or death decision on the end of it. And the fact is, they see it as a life or death decision because they've been told by, by the internet and other folks that they're gonna kill their kid or give them autism if, they, uh, if, if they, they get vaccinated. And we frame it as a life or death decision 
your kid's going to die from measles if you don't get vaccinated. It, it, we need to, to be more willing to, to humble ourselves and to go out into the community and, uh, and a answer these questions. And we also need to arm everyone to be public health advocates. It's not just the job of the Surgeon General. It's not just the job of, uh, of the public health folks in the room. It's the job of the CEOs and the architects and the police officers and the faith leaders and help them understand how a healthier community helps all of them also. So thank you. Hello, thank you so much for your talk. I'm Londetta Jones, I'm a faculty member in the University of Maryland School of Medicine. And I, I come from a campus which has an amazing uh, professional schools which I think together can really impact and eliminate health disparities working together. And to this end, I um, created a focus group uh, with uh, community members and faculty together. And, and one of the blaring things that came out is the issue of trust. Um, historical things that has happened over the years that can often create barriers into partnership. But one thing that also emerged was the willingness of both faculty and community to want to learn and work together. However, I wanted to speak to your um, sort of experience as a faculty member, and you can understand that there's a lot of priorities and things that we need to meet and the struggle and perhaps lack of incentive to engage with the faculty, I mean, engage with communities, but it is so needed because relationship is so important to build those barriers, so uh, to break down those barriers. So I wanted to know from your perspective, um, what would you suggest um, for more engagement between um, sort of the, demands of faculty, but wanting to really understand the needs of the community? It, it's a great question, and Dr. Lushniak can relate to this. We actually are very much dealing with this within the Office of the Surgeon General. Anyone heard, that, heard of the uh, Tuskegee experiments? Notorious, right? They were overseen by a former Surgeon General. And so I think one of the things that we need to do um, is own it when we've done wrong to people. And that's at every level of, uh, of leadership. We need to say that was wrong, even if it was the best decision that the individual thought they could have made at the time. Um, but then that allows us to, to start to heal and move on. But it's hard for folks to heal if no one ever acknowledges that there was a, uh, a wrong done. Now, on the other side, it goes back to what I was saying before. Um, what I'm trying to do is help folks understand that anytime anyone anywhere suffers from a health inequity, we all pay the price. Uh, over half the births in this country are paid for by Medicaid, which means they're paid for by the taxpayers, which means if you have a bad outcome, the taxpayers are going to have to pay more money for that individual. When a mother has a child that is sick, um, she's, less, she's more likely to miss work She's less likely to be productive at work because she's worried about her sick child. She may not even be able to keep the job. And again, we have more unfilled jobs than we have people looking for work in this country. So one of the things I'm trying to do is not just say, point out the disparities for disparity's sake. Because at the end of the day, a CEO or a CFO of a company may feel bad in his heart that there are disparities going on in the community, but that's not going to drive them to make decisions, particularly with their company's money with their shareholders' money that's going to uh, actually improve health. But if we show that addressing those disparities makes a difference, then um, to their bottom line, creates a healthier workforce, and we need the studies to show that, and we need to bring the people to the table and have those discussions, then we can move that. Now, you, you talked uh, very specifically about faculty. Another thing that I'm passionate about, we do a decent job of uh, workforce diversity training, but to the deans in the room, we do a very poor job of diverse workforce training. Workforce diversity training is helping folks understand how they can speak to uh, individuals from different backgrounds, different cultures more effectively. And that is very important. But diverse workforce training is where I've seen that there is a huge problem. Uh, I had a huge problem as a faculty member trying to uh, make steps forward to uh, become, uh, along the path from uh, from uh, assistant professor uh, to professor. Uh, there's not a lot of mentorship there. Uh, as head of the state health department, uh, interestingly enough, as head of a state health department, you spend very little time dealing with actual health issues. 
more often than not, you spend time dealing with HR issues, dealing with professional issues. And I would see time and again that we would have problems that came to my table uh, with people from diverse backgrounds. And it was because a lot of times they didn't receive the professional development that other individuals had received. They didn't know how to deal with conflict. They didn't know how to promote themselves in a world where they were the only person that looked like them. And so we need to do a much better job of diverse workforce training because then that gets to your trust point. When you walk into a, a hospital and nobody looks like you, you're not gonna have that trust. And you're operating from a trust deficit. But when you walk in and there are more people who look like you, when someone addresses you in your native language, uh, when someone can tell a story that puts you at ease, then that builds that trust instantly and, uh, and helps people not only uh, be healthier as individuals, but helps the institution have better outcomes. And so we need to show institutions, academic institutions, that having a diverse workforce will help them achieve a healthier bottom line, a healthier economic return, and it's not just diversity for diversity's sake. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that really um, bothers me is you go to institutions and you talk about diversity and then they send you to someone who's in a back corner somewhere and say, that's our director of diversity, go talk to them. But it's not something that's embedded into the, uh, the rest of the system of the organization because they see it as, as a box to be checked off and not as something that's integral to the overall success of the organization. We've got to help them see that it's not just appropriate for the individual, but it is appropriate for the success of the overall organization, and that's what I'm striving to do. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chris Williams. My question is also about disparities, uh, particularly in light of rapid land redevelopment. Mm -hmm. American cities, both large and small, are seeing economic development, particularly in their core uh, economic town centers, that they've not seen in decades. 50 years plus in many parts of Washington, D.C. There is a recent study that showed that as a result of economic development and vitality in the district that 20,000 black residents had uh, been displaced. Their word uh, in the study, not mine. And so that raises some questions about equity, particularly about disparities because those who are displaced are uh, typically less well off and they then sort of move to areas that have concentrated poverty. I really appreciate the discussion, certainly the theme for today's conference, but also your discussion about cross-sector collaboration. How do we have these tough discussions about how we redesign our cities? And uh, I believe we, we probably are redesigning them to promote health. We have bike lanes and all those things, but the people that one might argue would benefit the most from that are, are really vulnerable to displacement. How do you think we could have a productive conversation about health and uh, economic development? It's a great question. We are doing a better job of redesigning and rebuilding our cities and communities to promote health, but we aren't doing such a great job of redesigning them and building them to promote health equity. And uh, oftentimes what happens is we pat ourselves on the back, like you said, for the new bike lane or the new smoke-free law, but we don't address the gentrification that's occurring. And we actually see the disparities widen, even though we pat ourselves on the back for the health statistics slowly improving. And smoking is a great example of this. Smoking rates have been going down for years, but the disparities have been slowly widening because we have the interventions in the affluent communities in the communities of, uh, of, of whites, and we allow the cigarette companies to continue to prey on communities of color. And so what can you do? Well, and again, I'm, I'm sorry if I sound like a broken record, but we have to invite the, uh, the architects, the planners, the other folks to our table, but even more than that, we've got to go to their table. Because servant leadership, again, isn't telling the architects and the planners that you need to have health in all of your policies. It's going to their table and listening to their concerns and saying, okay, how do we build a community that helps you meet your goals, that helps you build a housing complex that is gonna be more attractive to people because 
that's going to have diversity represented within that housing complex, that's going to help your school be more diverse in a place where you actually want to send your kids to so that that becomes an attractive um, uh, in, uh, end. And, uh, and I also talk about workforce. Uh, there are companies that are doing really innovative things because of the housing situation. You talk about Amazon. Uh, one of the big problems with the, uh, the Amazon headquarters in Seattle is it's driven everyone away because housing prices went through the roof. So companies are looking at how do we move to a town and become part of an affordable housing situation so that people don't have to commute in from an hour and a half out to get back and forth to work. But that's two ways. It's, it's us doing the research to show that healthier communities lead to a healthier bottom line and not just health and health equity. Um, but it's also us going to their table, being humble, not getting behind our podium and wagging our fingers at them about gentrification. I mean, it's important that we have these discussions, but, but saying, okay, so what are your concerns? Your concerns are how do we bring tax revenue to downtown? How do we build a new housing complex that people want to move to? And then saying, okay, we hear you. Let's figure out how we get there together and have an outcome that is, that, that's better for you and better for us. Hi, uh, my name is Robert Christian. I'm a student at the University of Maryland School of Nursing out of University of Maryland, Baltimore. I attend the uh, universities at Shady Grove campus, which is coincidentally, uh, coincidentally right next to uh, Adventist Healthcare's Shady Grove Medical Center. Um, this fall, I'll be starting as an RN, and I know my personal priorities going into the job of nursing, patient advocacy, all those types of things. I'm curious about your, uh, the Surgeon General's views on the bigger picture concerning nursing. Um, and I know you said you have a lot of varying priorities, but what are the priorities from the Surgeon General's office's uh, stand, uh, point of view concerning the, the field of nursing? Like, what are your, what are your priorities concerning so nursing? So, that, that's a great question. And congratulations, by the way, Thank moving you. on to the next stage of your career. The Commission Corps has 11 different categories. Doctors, nurses, pharmacists, environmental health officers, engineers. We have a variety of folks, and so more than anyone else, I think we see the value of nurses. We see the value of many other professions in contributing to the overall health and public health of, uh, of communities. And so when you ask what's the Surgeon General doing, one of the things we're doing is leading the Public Health Service Corps, and our largest category is our nursing category. We're also trying to uh, lift up new care models and within HHS, one of the things that we are really passionate about is shifting from pay for volume to pay for value. And uh, we know that if we shift the payment system, the, the saying again, every system is perfectly designed to get exactly the results that it gets. We have payment battles. We have scope of practice battles. We have all these battles going on in our communities in regards to health care because we're paying for the wrong things. If we ultimately pay for outcomes, and then give people the flexibility to design systems and programs and bring partners to the table, community health workers, for instance, that deliver better outcomes. And I'm looking at the dean of the School of, uh, of Dentistry here. We have dentists in the Commission Corps, and uh, one of the things that I, I think is unfortunate is a long time ago, we cut the head off from the body. And we said, if you have a mental health issue, if you have a vision health issue, if you have an oral health issue, go see someone else. That's not part of my job as a physician when I see you for your annual physical. Um, we need to reattach that. We need to help folks understand the value that comes from, uh, from paying attention to the outcomes and not just paying for the procedures. And I think if we do that, <clears throat> then we can continue to lift up nurses and the value that nurses can provide um, what, when, they, uh, when, they, when they bring it to the table and stop with the, uh, the um, one-off uh, political fights that go on that many cases distract from the overall mission of healthier patients. So thank you very much. Oh, I'm in good shape. I'm, I, can, I can get through one more question without a water. Thank you. <laughs> um, my name is Jordan. I'm a senior student here at the university and president of a student organization known as Public Health Action Through Civic Engagement. Um, so in terms of partnerships, particularly with the education community, I was wondering what methods you think were best to encourage and support educators to mitigate with issues that you reference, such as adverse childhood experiences and um, even the effects of drug abuse and addiction of parents and mental health? 
both my parents were school teachers. Um, my, uh, my sister-in-law is a school principal. Uh, the folks who are dealing with our students, uh, they're overwhelmed. My father actually retired from teaching um, and tells this story of uh, when an eighth grader first came to him and t I mean, she, he was the first person that she told that she was pregnant. And, uh, he, and my father's old school. Um, he's, set, he's going on 75 now. He said, that's not what I went into, te into teaching to do. But I mean, I think it reflects the fact that our teachers are, are overwhelmed. Overwhelmed with, many, with so many different issues and they're just trying to get through the day and keep these kids safe. And then, at the, and, and then they're also being told, you're not gonna get paid if your kids don't do well on these tests. And so again, every system's perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. So let's suspend the kid, let's get rid of the kid who's bringing down my average so that uh, the denominator then becomes, uh, becomes smaller and I, and I can perform better. So what we, again, really need to do is put ourselves in the positions of these teachers and not go to them and say, your kids are vaping, you need an anti-vaping program. Your kids are using marijuana, you need an anti-marijuana program. Your kids are fat, you need an anti-obesity program. Your kids, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We need to sit down with them and say, how can we work together to help these kids perform better in school? And then that opens the door for us to talk about the adverse childhood experiences that are going on in communities and to talk about how we can work together to put in a program that not only provides, again, better house outcomes, but also provides better school performance and less discipline problems. And so, uh, again, it comes back to servant leadership. It comes back to humility. It comes back to going to their table and figuring out how we can help them achieve their goals instead of expecting that we're going to have a bunch of teachers who are overwhelmed sit down and listen to us give a lecture on adverse childhood experiences for the sake of adverse childhood experiences. And so that, that, that's, that's really my approach that I've taken and I found that it's very effective. I, I truly have, it's not just pie in the sky. It's amazing. People need to know that you care before they care what you know. And it's amazing when you simply show them that you care, that you're willing to listen to them, whether it's a teacher or whether it's a, a child in a community who's suffering from an adverse childhood experience or whether it's a business leader, when you truly sit down and say, I truly want to hear about your concerns, I truly want to help you address your problems versus I want you to help me address mine, you see things turn around quite a bit. Can I, can I take, take on two other issues? Thank you so much. You all, Boris must have told you all to behave. You all didn't ask about guns. You didn't ask about the Affordable Care Act. You didn't ask about, wow. Anyone want to know about those things? <laughs> so, uh, it is, uh, he's cutting me off, see? No, no, no. He's trying to save me. It's a rare day that, a day, uh, it, it is rare that a day goes by without a mention of gun violence in our country. What strategies do you believe are essential to curb and ultimately prevent gun violence? And I don't have the person who uh, Okay. Well, uh, you know, what's interesting is I went to uh, undergrad at UMBC. And uh, going there, every time you turned on the TV, every time you heard about Baltimore, there was this, uh, there was gun violence. It was a discussion about gun violence. And you grew up in a, in a culture that was very attuned to the dangers of people owning guns. And then I left there and went out to Indiana University for uh, medical school. And my father-in-law lives on a farm in rural Indiana. And true story, we've sat out on his back porch and watched coyotes run across the backyard and had to get out his gun to scare off the, the coyotes to keep them from eating the chickens in the, um, in, in the, uh, on the farm. My kids actually are looking forward to going there for Easter so that uh, we can go out and go skeet shooting out, 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 uh, out in, the, in the back field uh, over the corn. And so you have one community where guns and the availability of guns is seen as an existential threat to your existence, and another community where it's seen as this is family bonding time at Easter or the ability to protect our livelihood. So we have to understand that, that it's very, very difficult to come up with national policies that address issues where people have such fundamentally different views and such fund fundamentally different cultures. And that's not to say that there's nothing we can do nationally. I don't want anyone to take that from what I'm saying. But we really have to 
empower folks to have local conversations and to come up with policies that promote safe firearm ownership, whether you're talking about Baltimore or whether you're talking about Fort Wayne, Indiana. And so that, that's, my, that's where I am on guns. I really do believe there is a lot of low-hanging fruit out there. Um, I'm really concerned about our suicide rates in this country. There's 20 veterans who die by suicide each and every day. I think that's the place where there's common ground. I think whether people believe in gun ownership or don't, I think that they, um, <clears throat> that they still uh, believe that people should safely own firearms. And uh, we need to have the courage to, to, again, have that more nuanced conversation. And uh, when you do, there, there's great examples. There's actually a firearm safety coalition in Colorado where they brought together gun, um, uh, gun shops, police officers, and physicians to discuss firearm safety and, and making gun locks more available and gun safes more available. So it is possible, but again, it's got to be better health through better partnerships. It can't be the gun advocates on one side saying, Second Amendment, they want to take away our guns, and the public health folks on the other side saying, no one should own a gun, and if you believe in people owning guns, then you're anti-kids and you're anti-health. It's got to be a conversation that allows us to come up with policies that protect my kids, and my, my father-in-law is very adamant about gun safety with my boys. The guns are in a safe on that rural Indiana farm, and the boys aren't allowed to touch them or come near them unless grandpa's with them. And it's very oriented towards gun safety, but it is not an anti-gun household. It's a pro-gun safety household. And, and, and that's, that's where I think we need to move to on the gun issue. Um, Affordable Care Act. I get, a question, get questions about that all the time. And um, I want every one of you all to know that I passionately believe that individuals should be able to uh, access high-quality, affordable health care. I believe that. I believe we need to separate political vehicles from, uh, from destinations. And so the destination is high quality, affordable health care. Um, but this is just a fact. The Affordable Care Act is a political football. And there are people out there who, if you ask them, do you agree that people need access to high, qual to high quality, affordable health care, they'll completely agree with the destination. But if you ask them, Did you believe, do you believe in the Affordable Care Act, you'll have some people who say it's completely illegal and the worst thing that ever happened to our country. And you'll have other people who will say, it's absolutely the best thing in the world. And so uh, I come from Indiana. Indiana is one of the uh, red states that um, utilized uh, federal funding to expand access and, to, and coverage to people through our Healthy Indiana plan. But we got a Medicaid waiver. And uh, we also have some, some unique things built into our system that, quite frankly, a lot of uh, uh, folks who, uh, who are liberally aligned didn't like. But that was what the community was willing to accept when we said, how do we expand coverage to people? And I'm proud to say that we expanded coverage to 400,000 people in Indiana as a result of that compromise, a compromise that a lot of other states haven't made because of the political fighting back and forth. So again, all that is to say, as leaders, I think it's your job, it's our job, it's my job to be the adults in the room, to be the mediators, to not be the ones who, uh, who demonize um, and, and, and over-politicize some of these issues, but really say, what can we agree on? Can we agree on safe firearm ownership? Should, can we agree that, that a kid um, shouldn't have, or, or a person with a mental health issue shouldn't have access to a gun? Can we agree that folks um, should be able to access health care when they most need it? And then let's start working backwards and figuring out how we get there without being sucked into the trap of over-politicizing things uh, that we often get, get caught in. So uh, thank you all for the great questions. Thank you for the opportunity to, to again, um, be here today. And thank you for the opportunity to serve as your 20th United States Surgeon General. Uh, it truly is the honor of my uh, life. And I want you all to understand that I take it very seriously. I am your United States Surgeon General, and I really have tried to come up with cross-cutting issues that allow me to, to lift up whatever issue you care about. I really do love to engage because I learn so much from you all, and I want to be that representative for you all 
in the room. The final thing I would say, and Dr. Lushniak, I'm sure, would support this too. There's a lot of folks who have a lot of um, bad feelings about uh, government in general, our federal and state institutions, and uh, some of our politicians. And uh, I will tell you very honestly, uh, number one, I'm an independent, so I don't have any political affiliation. Um, when my patients come into my operating room and I still practice a day a month at Walter Reed, I don't see Democrats or Republicans, I see people who need care. But uh, <clears throat> the people who I've come across consistently, there's no one out there who wants to hurt other people. There's a lot of people who, uh, who are getting paid a lot less than what they could in the private world to work in federal government, and they're hard workers. They just have different ways of viewing the world. And you're not going to engage them. Uh, actually, you're, you're, you're going to push them away if you use language that, again, demonizes them. And I mean that to folks on both sides of the table. I mean that to folks on both sides of the table. So uh, my plea to you is to please, please, try to use your voice to bring people in, to figure out where they're coming from, to know your audience, and to frame uh, your discussions in a way that will best resonate so that we can move health in the direction that we all want to today. Uh, otherwise, you're going to spend the day talking about great public health interventions that aren't going to move the needle because the key word in public policy is public. And if you want to translate those public health interventions into effective public policy, then you need to figure out how to resonate with your audience. And, and, and again, please, let, let's try to get beyond the politics and really look at the, the, uh, the goal that we want to achieve, and that's a healthier, a safer, a more secure, a more prosperous nation. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much. Um, this has been a great session. And again, how honored we are to have you here as a guest during National Public Health Week for the University of Maryland event. And so therefore, on behalf of the University of Maryland, both Baltimore as well as College Park and the whole community of public health workers, I bestow upon you a limited edition uh, acting Surgeon General Boris Lushniak coin. <laughs> I don't want to see this for sale on eBay tomorrow, sir, but anyhow. Again, ladies and gentlemen. Let, let, let me return the favor. Whoa, look at that, huh? Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the 20th Surgeon General of the United States, Vice Admiral Jerome Adams. Thank you all so much. How many of you all uh, know CPR? Raise your hand. OK, keep your hand up if you carry naloxone on you everywhere you go. So look around. Did you see the hands that came down? There's a person dying of an opioid overdose every 11 minutes in this country. And if we're going to be honest about it, you're probably more likely to have someone come in that back door and say someone's overdosing in the bathroom than you are to say, have someone come in that door and say someone's having a heart attack. Until we get to the point that more of your hands are up saying you know about and are carrying naloxone, we're not going to turn around this opioid overdose epidemic because the people who are dying from opioid overdoses, they're not dying in hospitals or medical settings. They're dying in bathrooms. They're dying in bedrooms. They're dying in garages. And until we invent an ambulance that can get to your house in four to five minutes, which is the amount of time it takes for anoxic brain injury, we're not going to stop overdose deaths from occurring unless we make naloxone more available. So uh, if you don't know about it, please go to surgeongeneral.gov. Look up my naloxone warning I put out last year. I also look up my Surgeon General's postcard, which lists five steps that every American can take to respond to the opioid epidemic. It's a throwback to C. Everett Koop's pamphlet on understanding AIDS that he sent to America 30 years ago when there was another crisis that was going on. There are real tangible steps that each and every one of you can take right now and today to respond to this opioid epidemic and to use this tragedy as an opportunity to lift up the health of communities. So again, thank you. Great. Uh, and now an uh, opportunity here for uh, Rear Admiral retired Dushanka Kleiman to give us more information. Well, first of all, thank you all and uh, thank you to the Surgeon General for the challenge that you've given to us and for bringing your whole team with you. Um, the Surgeon General is going to be exiting in the back, but I just wanted to say we're going to start our two sessions and everything that we have uh, today is going to be back down on the first floor. So in the atrium will be the sustainability at the nexus of food, energy, 
water, climate, and health. And in the Prince George's room is the panel on health technology and the impact of communities. So thank you again. You look beautiful. See you later.